the prophetic family the family of prophet muhammad is called the hashimite family after his grandfather hashim bin abd manaf let us now speak a little about hashim and his descendants hashim as we have previously mentioned he was the one responsible for giving food and water to the pilgrims this had been his charge when the sons compromised on dividing the duties between them hashim was wealthy and honest he was the first to offer the pilgrims soft bread in broth his first name was amar but he was called hashim because he had been in the practice of crumbling bread for the pilgrims he was also the first man who started the two journeys of summer and winter of the kodash it has been narrated that he went to syria as a merchant upon his return he went to madina where he married salma the daughter of amr from bani adi he stayed with her in madina for some time then left for syria again while she was pregnant he died in gaza in palestine in 497 ce later his wife gave birth to abdul muttalib and named him shaiba because of the white hair on his head and brought him up in her father's house in madina none of his family in makkah learned of his birth hashim had four sons asad abu saifi nadla and abdul muttalib and five daughters ashifa khalida daifa rukayya and janna abdul muttalib we have already learned that after the death of hashim the charge of the pilgrims food and water went to his brother al muttalib bin abd manaf who was honest generous and trustworthy when abdul muttalib reached the age of boyhood his uncle al muttalib heard of him and went to madina to bring him to makkah when he saw him tears filled his eyes and rolled down his cheeks he embraced him and took him on his camel the boy however abstained from going with him to makkah until he took his mother's consent al muttalib asked her to send the boy with him to makkah but she refused he managed to convince her saying your son is going to makkah to restore his father's authority and to live in the vicinity of the sacred house in makkah people wondered at seeing abdul muttalib and considered him the slave of muttalib al muttalib said he is my nephew the son of my brother hashim the boy was brought up in al muttalib's house but later on al muttalib died in radman in yaman so abdul muttalib took over and managed to maintain his people's prestige and outdo his grandfathers in his honorable behavior which gained him makkah's deep love and high esteem when al muttalib died nawfal usurped the duties of abdul muttalib so the latter asked for help from the quraish but they abstained from extending any sort of support to either of them consequently he wrote to his uncles of bani an najjar his mother's brothers to come to his aid his uncle abu saad bin adi marched to makkah at the head of 80 horsemen and camped in afta in makkah abdul muttalib received the men and invited them to go to his house but abu saad said not before i meet nawfal he found nawfal sitting with some old man of quraish in the shade of the kaaba abu saad drew his sword and said i swear by allah that if you don't restore to my nephew what you have taken 
I will kill you with this sword. Nofol was thus forced to give up what he had usurped unlawfully, and the notables of the Quraysh were made to witness the, to his words. Abu Saad then went to Abdul Muttalib's house, where he stayed for three nights, performed Umrah, and left to return to Medina. Later on, Nofol entered into an alliance with Bani Abd Shams against Bani Hashim. When Khuza, a tribe, saw Bani and Najar's support to Abdul Muttalib, they said, He is our son as he is yours. We have more reasons to support him than you. Abd Manaf mother was one of them. They went into a Nadwa house and entered into an alliance with Bani Hashim against Bani Abd Shams and Nawful. It was an alliance that was later to constitute the main reason for the conquest of Makkah. Abdul Muttalib did witness two important events in his lifetime, namely digging the Zamzam well and the elephant raid. In brief, Abdul Muttalib received an order in his dream to dig the Zamzam well at a particular place. He did so and found the articles that the men of the Jurum had buried there when they were forced to evacuate Makkah. He found swords, armors, and two deer made of gold. The gate of the Kaaba was stamped with the gold swords and the two deer. And then the tradition of providing Zamzam water to pilgrims was established. When the well of Zamzam gushed forth water, the Quraysh made a claim to become partners in the enterprise. But Abdul Muttalib refused their demands on the grounds that Allah had singled only him out for this honorable job. To settle the dispute, they agreed to consult the diviner of Bani Saad. On their way, Allah showed them his signs that confirmed Abdul Muttalib's privilege about the sacred spring. Only then did Abdul Muttalib make a solemn vow to sacrifice one of his adult children to the Kaaba if he had ten. The second event was that of Abraham, a Saba al-Habashi, the Abyssinian viceroy in Yemen. He had seen that the Arabs made their pilgrimage to the Kaaba, so he built a large church in Sana in order to attract the Arab pilgrims to it, to the exclusion of Makkah. A man from the Kinana tribe understood his motives. Therefore he entered the church under the cover of night smearing excrement on its front wall. When Abraham learned of this, he became enraged and led a great army of 60,000 warriors to demolish the Kaaba. He chose the biggest elephant for himself. His army included between 9 to 13 elephants. He continued marching until he reached a place called Al Mugmas. There he mobilized his army and prepared his elephants to enter Makkah. When he reached the Muhassir Valley, between Musdalifa and Mina, the elephant knelt down and refused to go forward. Whenever they directed it to the north, south or east, the elephant moved quickly. But when directed towards the Kaaba in the west, it knelt down. Meanwhile, Allah sent birds in flight upon them pelting them with stones of big clay so that they became like scattered chef. These birds were like swallows and sparrows, each carrying three stones, one on its beak and two in its claws. The stones hit Abraham's men, cut their limbs and killed them. A large number of Abraham's soldiers were killed in this way, and the others fled helter-skelter and died at other places. Abraham himself developed an infection that required his fingertips to be cut off. When he reached Sana, he was in a miserable state and died soon after. The Quraysh fled for their lives to the hills and mountain tops. When the enemy was routed, they returned home safely. 
The elephant incident took place in the month of Al Muharram, 50 or 55 days before the birth of the Prophet Muhammad, which corresponded to late February or early March 571 CE. It was a favor from Allah to his Prophet and his family. It could legitimately be regarded as a divine auspicious sign of the light to come and accompany the advent of the Prophet and his family. In contrast, Jerusalem had suffered the atrocities of Allah's enemies. Here we can recall the reign of Bakhtanesar in 587 BC and the Romans in 70 CE. The Kaaba, by divine grace, never came under the hold of the Christians, who were the people of the book of that time, although Makkah was populated by polytheists. News of the elephant incident reached the most distant corners of the civilized world. Abyssinia, Ethiopia maintained strong ties with the Romans while the Persians on the other hand were watchful of any strategic changes looming on the socio-political horizon and soon came to occupy Yemen. The Roman and Persian empires made up the powerful civilized world at that time. The elephant incident attracted the world's attention to the sanctity of Allah's house and showed that this house had been chosen by Allah for its holiness. It followed then if any of its people claimed prophethood, it would confirm with the outcome of the elephant incident and would provide a justifiable explanation for the ulterior divine wisdom that lay behind backing polytheists against Christians in a manner that went beyond the cause and effect formula. Abdul Muttalib had 10 sons. Some say he had 11 sons. Still others say that he had 13 sons. They add that Abdul Kaaba is the same as a Makwan and that he also had 6 daughters. Number 3. Abdullah the father of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his mother was Fatima, daughter of Amr bin Ayat, bin Imran, bin Makzum, bin Yagza, bin Murrah. Abdullah was the brightest of Abdul Muttalib's sons. The most chaste and the most loved. He was also the son towards whom the divination arrows pointed to be slaughtered as a sacrifice at the Kaaba. When Abdul Muttalib had ten sons and they reached maturity, he disclosed to them his secret vow which they accepted obediently. Their names were written on divination arrows and given to the guardian of their most beloved goddess, Hubal. The arrows were shuffled and drawn. An arrow showed that it was Abdullah who was to be sacrificed. Abdul Muttalib then took the boy to the Kaaba with a razor to slaughter him. However, the Quraysh, his uncles from the Magzum tribe and his brother Abdul Talib tried to advise him against it. He then sought their advice as regards his vow. They suggested that he would summon a woman diviner to judge the matter. She ordered that the divination arrows should be drawn again, but including ten camels and Abdullah. She added that drawing the lot should be repeated with ten more camels every time the arrow showed Abdullah. The action was thus repeated until the number of camels amounted to 100. At this point, the arrow showed the camels. Consequently, they were all slaughtered instead of his son. The slaughtered camel camels were left for anyone to eat from, human or animal. This incident produced a change in the amount of blood money usually accepted in Arabia. Earlier it had been 10 camels, but after this event it was increased to 100. 
later on this was approved of in islam it was reported that the prophet once said i am the offspring of the slaughtered two meaning ismail and abdullah the prophet once said i am the offspring of the slaughtered two meaning ismail and abdullah abdul muttalib chose amina daughter of wahab as a wife for his son abdullah in the light of ancestral lineage she had an eminent standing rank to nobility of position and descent her father was the chief of bani zaira who was attributed great honor they were married in makka and soon after Abdullah was sent by his father to buy dates in Medina where he died. In another version, Abdullah went to Syria on a trade journey and died in Medina on his way back. He was buried in the house of Al Jadi. He was 25 years old when he died. Most historians state that his death was 2 months before the birth of Muhammad. some others said that his death was two or more months after the prophet's birth when amana was informed of her husband's death she commemorated his memory in a most heart-rending eulogy abdullah left very little wealth five camels a small number of goats a woman servant called baraka who would later serve as the prophet's nurse maid his birth muhammad's birth and 40 years prior to prophethood his birth muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the master of prophets was born in the bani hashim area of makka on monday morning the 9th of rabiul the same year of the elephant incident and 40 years into the reign of kisra that is the 20th or 22nd of april 571 according to the scholar muhammad and the astronomer mahmud pasha Ibn Saad reported that Muhammad's mother said when he was born there was a light that issued out of my pudendum and lit the palaces of Syria Ad-Darimi reported something similar to this it was reported that significant signs accompanied his birth Fourteen balconies of Kisra's palace collapsed. The Magians' sacred fire went out, and some churches on Lake Sava sank down and collapsed. This was recorded by At Tabari. and others but none of the chains of narrations are confirmed his mother immediately sent someone to inform his grandfather abdul mutalib of the happy event happily he came to her carried the infant to the kaaba prayed to allah and thanked him Abdul Muttalib called the infant Muhammad a name not common among the Arabs He circumcised him on the 7th day and was as was the custom of the Arabs The first woman who suckled him after his mother was Thubaiba the freed slave of Abu Lahab with her son Masru She had suckled Hamza before and later Abu Salama 
it was the general custom of the arabs living in towns to send their children away to bedouin wet nurses so that they might grow up in the free and healthy surroundings of the desert thereby they would develop a strong body and acquire the pure speech and manners of the bedouins who were noted both for chastity of their language and for being free from the vices which usually develop in inactive societies the prophet was later entrusted to halima bin her husband was al harith from the same tribe muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had several foster brother and sisters and the prophet's cousin hamza the prophet's uncle was succored by the same two wet nurses thuwaiba and asadia who suckled the prophet there are delightful traditions relating how halima and her entire household were favored by successive strokes of good fortune while muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam lived under her care as an infant ibn ishaq states that halima narrated that she along with her husband and a suckling infant set out from her village in the company of some women from banu in quest of children to suckle she said it was a year of drought and famine and we had nothing to eat i rode on a brown mule we also had with us an old she camel by allah we would not get even a drop of milk we could not have a wink of sleep during the night for the child kept crying because of hunger there was not enough milk in my breast and even the she camel had nothing to feed him we used to constantly pray for rain and immediate relief at length we reached makkah looking for children to suckle not even a single woman among us accepted when allah's messenger was offered to her as soon as they were told that he was an orphan they refused him we had fixed our eyes on the reward that we would get from the child's father an orphan what were his grandfather and mother likely to do so we refused to accept him because of that every woman who came with me got a suckling infant and when we were about to depart i said to my husband by allah i do not like to go back along with the other women without any infant i should go to that orphan and i must take him he said there is no harm in doing so and perhaps allah might bless us through him so i went and took him because there was simply no other alternative left for me but to take him when i lifted him in my arms and returned to my place i put him on my breast and to my great surprise i found enough milk in it he drank to his heart's content and so did his foster brother and then both of them went to sleep although my baby had not been able to sleep the previous night my husband then went to the she camel to milk it and to his astonishment he found plenty of milk in it he milked it and we drank to our fill and enjoyed a sound sleep during the night the next morning my husband said by allah o halima you must understand that you have got a blessed child and i replied by the grace of allah i hope so the tradition is clear on the point that halima's return journey and her subsequent life as long as the prophet stayed with her was encircled with a halo of good fortune 
the donkey that she rode when she came to makkah was lean and almost lame it recovered speed much to the amazement of halima's fellow travelers by the time they reached the encampments of the bani saad clan in the country they found the scales of fortune turned to their favor the barren lands sprouted luxuriant grass and the animals went out to pasture and came back to them satisfied and full of milk muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam stayed with halima for 2 years until he was weaned as halima said we then took him back to his mother earnestly requesting her to have him stay with us so that we may benefit from the good fortune and blessings he brought us we persisted in our request expressing our anxiety over the child catching a certain infection peculiar to makka at last we were granted our wish and the prophet stayed with us until we returned with him the prophet stayed with them until he was about 4 or 5 years old then as related by anas gabriel came down opened his chest and took out the heart he then extracted a blood clot out of it and said that was the part of shaitan in the and then he washed it with the water of zamzam in a gold basin after that the heart was joined together and restored to its place the boys and playmates went running to his mother that is his nurse and said verily muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been murdered they all rushed towards him and found him to be all right and that only his face was pale nana said i have seen the mark that was left on his chest back to his passionate mother after this event halima was worried about the boy and returned him to his mother with whom he stayed until he was 6 in respect of the memory of her late husband Amina decided to visit his grave in Yathrib Medina. She set out to cover a journey of 500 kilometers with her orphan boy. Her father-in-law Abdul Muttalib and a woman servant um ayman she spent a month there and then made her way back to makkah on the route she suffered a severe illness and died in awwa on the road between makkah and medina to his compassionate grandfather abdul muttalib brought the boy to makkah He had warm emotions towards the boy, his orphan grandson, whose recent calamity, his mother's death, added to the pain of his past bereavement. Abdul Muttalib was more compassionate and loving with his grandson than with his own children. He never left the boy fall prey to loneliness. but always preferred him to his own children ibn hashim reported a mattress was put in the shade of the kaaba for abdul muttalib his children used to sit around that mattress in deference to their father but muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to sit on it his uncles would try to take him back but if abdul muttalib was present he would say leave my grandson I swear by Allah that this boy will hold a significant position. He used to seat the boy on his mattress, pat his back, and was always pleased with what the boy did. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was eight years, two months, and ten days old. His grandfather Abdul Muttalib passed away in Makkah. The charge of the Prophet now passed on to his uncle Abu Talib. who was the full brother of the prophet's father abu talib took on the responsibility of his nephew in the best way 
he placed him with his own children and preferred him to them. He singled the boy out with great respect and held him in high esteem. Abu Talib remained thus for 40 years, cherishing his nephew and extending all possible protection and support to him. His relations with the others were determined in the light of the treatment they showed to the Prophet. Ibn Asaki deported on the authority who said, I came to Makkah when it was a rainless year. So the Quraysh said, O Abu Talib, the valley has become leafless and the children are hungry. Let us go and pray for and for. Abu Talib went to the Kaaba with a young boy who was as beautiful as the sun and a black cloud was over his head. Abu Talib and the boy stood by the wall of the Kaaba and prayed for rain. Immediately clouds from all directions gathered and rain fell heavily and caused springs to flow and plants to grow in the town and the country.